from Byron, Mississippi. It's Lakeshore Church. This is chapter 1, uh, verses 26 through 28. After we read, we'll have a prayer and then you can be, uh, be seated. We find these words recorded in the Christian standard. It says, verse number 26, Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created in him the image of God, and he created them male and female. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord. As we do, we mean it, Lord, as much now as ever. I pray, God, that my words would be yours. I pray that my thoughts would be yours. And most of all, we would all walk in obedience to where you move us. I pray, God, that you would uh, reveal to us great truth in our own individual life, wherever we are in our journey with you. And God, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. For we ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. You might remember as you're settling in there, last week we talked a lot about the authority of God. That God was, God is, and he always will be, regardless of what you and I do with him. That God is still God. And then right off of that, as we, as we sort of, I won't say change gears, but we would go to the, the, the level under that, is we want to talk today about where does, where does man fit into this? Um, this, uh, this, this led to the sermon title. Uh, probably not everybody in the room is, is consumed with uh, college football like some others are. Uh, we have some. I mean, I, I've had some through the de- days. Uh, I'll never forget years ago, we had a young man at the church that was playing the, the drums. And uh, he was going off to college. And the day that he was going to be his last Sunday with us, and I actually thanked him. Uh, his name is Scotty. I thanked him for, for the years he played the drums. And, and, I, and I said, he's going off to Mississippi State University to school, I think if I remember right. And when I said that, all the Ole Miss fans booed in the church. I'll never forget. I remember thinking, uh, you folks need to come to Jesus or something. I don't know. We get really jacked up about those college athletics, it seems like. But there's been this thing in in college uh, athletics that's come about called name, image, and likeness. It's really fascinating. It's for years the debate was you got these colleges and universities and these these conferences that are making these millions and billions of dollars, and they're doing it on the back. Some people say of the of the, the of the athlete. So they've come up with this deal that if your name or your image or likeness is going to be used, that you should be paid for it, and that's where we are. And, and uh, it's almost comical to think about where it's going because it, the, the, the horse is out of the barn, I'm telling you, with this thing. I, I don't really know. Uh, I'm a Georgia fan, so I just hope Georgia has a lot of that money. But anyway, um, it, it's, it's amazing to me that that also is very unique, that you and I actually are created in God's name, image, and likeness. I, I'm not going to put a spiritual connotation on uh, secular athletics. I don't know if I can get away with that. But it is unique, a play on words, but each one of us, I wrote it down this way, that we all have an NIL with God. Whether you say it, whether you live it out or not, know this, that under God's name, you have his image and likeness. As individuals of Adam passed down to Adam, that's what the text tells us. It's unique. And I thought about this, what does that mean? (laughs) Well, the name of God... In verse number 26 of Genesis 1, what I read to you, it says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. It's a, it, you think about the, the usage there is us and our. That's where we get the, and the believe and very much believe in the Trinity. We believe in the Father. We believe in the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in a triune God. And, and some people have an issue with that and some religions do, but we very much believe that. Let us make man. In our own image. We also believe in, in the in what does the image of God means. And, and I remember for years I struggled with this. And I just want to give you how we've sort of processed it out. But humans are made in the image of God. Listen to this. In their moral and spiritual and intellectual nature. We are different as human beings than all other parts of God's creation. No other part of God's creation has this including all animals. Hmm. And then the likeness of God. And I, and I attribute some things to this. Listen to this. Humans possess qualities that reflect those of God, such as rationality. Sometimes I wonder, (laughs) all right? How about morality? How about understanding right from wrong, good from evil? And how about also the capacity for spiritual relationship? 
that you and I, our spiritual being will live forever somewhere. Somebody might say, well, Jay, that sounds good, but <laughs> there's why there's so many issues. If all this stuff that were made in God's name and his image and his likeness, then, then why are there so many problems in the world? Well, you got to remember, folks, that we're a fallen people. That Adam and Eve, it was put before them and they failed miserably. And, and that misery has been passed down, that sin has been passed down to every one of us because we need a remedy for it. <laughs> That's why we need a remedy, I should say. I found this and it's a, uh, an Irish philosopher. It was pretty neat. He said this, and he's, he's a modern day. He said, within each of us exists the image of God. You need to get that. Whether you do anything with it or not, whether somebody adheres to that, we're still made in God's image and his likeness. But watch this. However disfigured or corrupted by sin, it may presently be. See, what's happened is there's a lot of things that are being laid on God that's really man's fault. There's a lot of issues that we go through in life. There's the things we experience that God never intended, but yet a result from sin. And also, Jesus came to correct it. And give us an opportunity for it to be corrected in our life. All right? We are made in his image and likeness, but sin messed it up. That's what I want to share with you. Just entitled, uh, entitled these points, the, the, uh, the NIL for man. The name, image, and likeness for man. What, what was it all about? Well, I want to share with you uh, today. First, I think about the domain of man. And um, I've thought about through some of these sermons, it seems like I don't want it to be so textbook and so much information. Uh, I almost felt like that, that a few of these looking at them, we almost need to have the invitation during prayer time because it's so much information at the end of it. I don't know about decision, I, we, we won't, but it, it's, it's needed in our own individual life to understand these things. I don't think you can grow in your life until you have an understanding. Somebody said it best about salvation. You can't be saved until you understand or you realize you're lost. And so it's the same way. But I want to share with you the, do, the domain of man. Uh, it, it, that's, a, that's a big statement. Man has its place in God's creation. And if you want to look at it this way, last week we talked about the authority of God. He's top rung. There's no one that can compete with him. That is, that is what the, the, the Lucifer tried to sell to Eve and thus Adam, is that you can be equal with God. Well, God's authority, he has no equal. His ways and thoughts are higher than ours. But listen to me very carefully. Right under that, the next rung, if you will, the next level is man. Man is not on an equal plane in his domain. He's not on an equal plane with the rest of the creation. We're different. You need to hear this. All the guys from D now need to hear this. Because you're not going to hear this in school. You're not going to hear this from, from secular education. There's somehow we played this game. And watch what's happened. There, there's, there's people that try to be equal with God. There was what was Lucifer was selling, what Satan was selling to Eve. But watch this. Now what happens, if we know we can't be equal with God, then if we don't watch it, then we elevate the other parts of the creation to be equal with us. <laughs> and that's not right either. You and I have a domain. And what I want to show you quickly is that mentally we're different. Okay? Think about this. We make decisions every day. We make choices we have reasoning within us. God created human beings to be different. It's almost comical some of the things I read about how somebody has observed some bird over on another continent and they've reasoned, they, they come up with this conclusion that they're like human beings because of the way they conduct themselves. Listen, you need to get you some mayonnaise and some bread and make you a bologna sandwich out of that stuff, okay? Mentally, we're not the same. And that intellect and freedom that you and I possess and that free will comes from Almighty God because it's a reflection of Him in our life and the way He made us. We choose the way to go. It just doesn't happen. Secondly, morally, we're different. Man is morally different than the rest of the creation. We are created in righteousness and perfect innocence, a reflection of God's holiness, but sin messed it up, and therefore we're born in sin. I want to remind you, and we're going to have a whole sermon on this. I can't wait to preach 30 minutes on being naked, all right? Just checking to make sure you're still awake over at D-Nowers. It says when they sinned, they realized they were naked. What did God say? Who told you you were naked? So morally, they realized something had changed. And it's been changed ever since. Aren't you glad we have clothes on today? Just get a visual picture of that. But then also socially, we're different. Man is different than all the rest. You and I were created for fellowship. God would come in the cool of the day and, and they had a relationship with one another. Fellowship and so, they were social with each other. And yet I want to remind you that when they sinned, you remember the first thing they did besides realizing they were naked? You remember what they went and did? They went and hid. 
because socially they had been affected by sin in their life. A question that arises is this. Many people deal with this, and it's, it's me jumping off the cliff for a few minutes in the sermon. But the question arises with all the stuff out there, where, where does the caveman fit, Brother Jay? Where does Cro-Magnon man fit, Neanderthal man? You know, I don't believe we're connected. We're connected to Adam. I've just seen some people that make me wonder sometimes. But anyway, but listen to me. Where, does, where do the dinosaurs fit? Well, there's really two views, and I want to give them to you quickly. I'm not adhering to them. I'm not promoting them. I'm just telling you where we are with theologians and others who believe the things that we believe. There are two views. One is science and all of its messages, uh, methods are flawed. Uh, many believe that the flood messed it up, and we've tried to figure out. I, so there's some people that believe because we're so anti-God, we have to come up with all these theories and all these things that, that fit it's almost like anti-God thinking, the carbon dating, how in the world, you know, we can't remember what we did last year. We're going to tell when something's 10 million years old. You know, how does all this work? That's one view. It's very just superficial. There's really no substantial proof. We just come up, we just fill in the, the, the things, if you will. Hmm. Changed everything. The flood is what changed it all. Noah's flood. Then there's a second view. And the second view is a pre-Adamite civilization. That before God, there was living beings. Not humans per se, but there was living beings. Not human beings made in the image of likeness of God, but something that was before Adam. That was before 6,000 years ago. And in that, people would say, well, that's where the dinosaur and Cro-Magnon man and, and the like all fit. Listen to me very carefully. Regardless of what you believe, regardless of how old you think the earth is or young the earth is, everybody in this room is a descendant of Adam. And Adam, you'll see in the scripture in just a moment, was the first man. So if anything went on before Adam and Eve were created, if the world's been around for a while, there's not been any other men there. There was no need for redemption in God's creation if that was what it was. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's, let's get into the word a little bit. And we'll find this. So it is written, the first man, Adam, <laughs> it didn't say the next round. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who's the last Adam? Ah, here you go. All right, verse 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Like the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. Like the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. Wow. We have a spirit. If you remember when Adam was, when Adam was created, he, was, he breathed into him, you know? And it wasn't just physical oxygen. He became a living being. We need to understand that. And see, so we, we have a spirit within us. And then in that, we, we're reminded what it says in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I've been fascinated for years of, of uh, capitalization in the word of God. And here is a great verse. God is spirit. In other words, if you're going to try to make him tangible, it's not going to work out too well for you. God is spirit, just like you and I have a spirit. But watch this. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit, capital S. Oh, isn't that neat? That's like us in worship this morning. Some might say, well, man, Brother Jay got carried away in that worship this morning. Some of the Dean Hours died. You know how why we got carried away? Because we're in the spirit. Because we know Jesus Christ. The scripture says to things like this, for the person who, who has that, the preaching doesn't have it, to the preaching of the cross, to them who perish, they don't have the spirit, to them it's foolishness. In other words, there's people today, if they don't know Christ, maybe you're here, I hope not, I hope everybody here knows him, but not, if not, today's the day for you. But listen, people come in church and go, what the world are they doing? What are they doing standing up? What are they doing worshiping, raising hands and getting all excited because we're in the spirit. We've been born of the spirit and we have a relationship with God Almighty and Spirit and the truth. Pretty good stuff. Then I offer man, the, the domain of man, but also, secondly, the dominion of man. I told you a lot of this stuff is information, but we need it. We're building a foundation on this Genesis issue, all right? But the dominion of man. Listen, I got to tell you again, as human beings, we're all superior. We're superior to every other part of the creation except God Almighty, the creator. Human beings have dominion over the rest of creation. It's the text today. God gave us dominion. And I don't want to define that and talk about it, but many of you know, some of you might not know, I love to hunt and fish. I mean, when I'm fishing, I, I can remember, I said this for years, Bo and I fished a lot together. I have a saying, when I catch a fish, all I want to do is catch one more. And when I catch the next one, I want to catch one more. I love catching fish. But if the next time I go fishing, all of a sudden a bass out there in the lake, he's got a pole and he's throwing a lure in my boat. 
trying to catch me, I don't think I'm going to fish anymore. You follow me? The next time I go deer hunting and all of a sudden I, I come around a tree and there's a deer standing there and he's got a gun, I think I'm going to find another hobby. And I know that's oversimplification, but you say, well, why are you saying that? Because we have dominion, folks. God gave us dominion. And a lot of people struggle. And I say this again, what's happened in our society? If, if maybe we're working on this thing, okay, I got it, Brother Jay. God's authority, he's higher than me and, and all that. But, but how about the lower part? I think there's damage we've done in God's creation that we brought other parts of the creation up to be equal with mankind. And that is not so. Amen? Don't make me on, amen on preaching this morning. We need to understand, I wrote it down. They are subject to us. We are not to them. Now, what I mean by dominion is I'm responsible. I, I love a, a, a cat and a dog with the best of them. I got a barn right now that's infested with a few rats. I, I, I want a cat that'll take care of them. But I got a couple of them big enough. They better bring their lunch, big as these rats are in my barn. I mean, I love animals. I got dogs, and, and, and we got love those things. I've owned horses before. I love God's creation, but they're not equal with me. Amen? Jesus didn't die to redeem them. Mm, the amen stopped. Well, Brother Jay, I like my little pooch. Well, you can like him or her, but they're not equal with you. Amen? I said amen. amen. See, we need this. And someone said, oh, Brother Jay, you're just awful. No, 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 because it's very dangerous. When we think a tree has the same eternal value that a human being has, we are in trouble, folks. And just because it's being said out there doesn't mean it's said in here. Oh, Okay. So what is the dominion of man? I found this and I want to read it to you. Listen to this. And I know it's, it's, it comes from a man's deal. It doesn't say women too, but you've got to own it too. Listen to this. Biblical manhood is defined by a man's direct position. Watch this. Under God and his rule. When a man is absent from God, his spiritual foundation is shaky, causing his God-given dominion to be compromised. I can't say it. I can't read it any better. That's what's going on today. When we compromise the place that God put man, we're in trouble. And it might not be trouble with our relationship with God. It might not be, well, I still know he's God. I've still been redeemed. And, and I still know that God's up there and I'm down here. And, but it might be the rest of the creation. This is what it says. You need to hear this. This includes marriage, family, job, and anything else within our sphere of influence. You know, one of my favorite words, I wrote it in my notes. Wow. Hmm. Listen, God-given dominion is not dominance. In a few weeks, I, I, I don't know if I'll tell you which week because I don't want you to miss church. But I'm going to unpackage male and female, and I'm not going to just do it from sexuality. I'm going to do it in the home too. Because there's a place that God put me in my home, and there's a place that Suzanne serves in our home. And all our kids serve in our home. And we have muddied the water so much that nobody knows where they're supposed to be anymore. Our society, the last 70 or 80 years, we've so, we've so put them all together, nobody knows anything anymore. But I'll tell you, we're going to give an account to Almighty God for the position that God put us in, the way that he made us. But listen to me. Just because I'm the head or I'm the leader of my home doesn't mean I'm dominant over Suzanne. I'm not that dumb. Do you all hear me? God gave us dominion, not dominance. It's stewardship and relationship, folks. And we're going to give an account to Almighty God. Mother Teresa said it well. I found this about the image of God. Said if everyone could see the image of God in his neighbor, do you think we would still need tanks and generals? Huh? If we would just live out the way God wants us to be in the image of God, it would change everything. If we would realize that we're underneath the authority of Almighty God, it would change you today in walking that out in your life. So there you go. Domain and dominance. I got one more for you. I almost found me a picture of so many of them. But uh, have you ever been fascinated? I'm thinking about the guy that spent the hours and hours putting all the dominoes on the floor just so they could hit one domino and it goes all crazy all over the place. It's amazing. They have, out in Las Vegas, they do them by the tens of thousands. I think I've seen them that's got over 500,000 dominoes that they put up. I'd be the guy, about 490,000, somebody would walk by and hit one of my dominoes. The reason I mention that is, is there's a thought that I have today is no matter what you do or you don't do with your life, it has a domino effect. What you do today will affect out there. Hmm. And you need to understand that. 
There's a uniqueness. And, and when we compromise that uniqueness, we compromise the domain that God gave us as, as men and women from Adam. And we, and, and we compromise the dominion that God gave us in creation. We pay a price for that. And I believe we're living that out in our society. Some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen, come on now. Craziest stuff you're ever going to read and see and, and people applaud. It, it's like this stuff is ludicrous. But we're living it out. You know why? Because it has a domino effect. Let me show you. Let me give you a quick parallels in the Word of God. You ready? It's found in the parable of the talents. Y'all remember that? If you want to go read and say it's great, it's a great devotional for a couple of days. But just go break it out. Some of you are doing this when I asked you to, and it's good stuff. But Matthew 25, verses 14 to 23, okay, is the, is, is the parable of the talents. And here's how the story goes. There was a master, there was a person over others that gave one five talents, gave one two, gave one one. Talents it was actually a sum of money. It, there was a value to it, all right? And he said, I'm going to be gone a while, and I want you to go use that talent, multiply it. And it says the one with five went and, went and multiplied it five more. I mean, they, they, they invested it, did well. The other one with two did that, but the one was scared. The one didn't do anything but bury it. And when the master came back, and what a great picture of God for us to understand. You go somewhere with God. Listen to me. God didn't redeem you for you, to, me, you and me to sit where we are and just sort of exist till he comes and gets us. No, he expects for us to shake and shine for him. Amen. To be salt and light. Five, he comes back, and the one, you remember the story? It's almost, it just says, that doesn't sound like God at all, Brother Jay. He took the one away from the one that did nothing with it and gave it to one of the others that did something with theirs. That doesn't even sound like God. Hmm. And you know some of the aspects, there's a lot of different angles. There are multiple angles of that parable. But I, I just wrote down some, listen to this. Some things we need to remember. One, everything in life has a direction. It doesn't sit still. That guy, was, he was taken to task by the master because he did nothing with what was given him. Hmm. Everything has a direction. Domino effect, okay? Secondly, <laughs> going nowhere is not an option. God expects for us to go somewhere. Next week, we're going to sign the people that read the Bible. Let me tell you something. Why wouldn't you read the Bible? Hello? It's God's Word in print. Why wouldn't we want to learn more? We're still breathing, amen? Why wouldn't we want to do more? Why wouldn't we want to go somewhere just sitting and, and keeping it to ourselves? That's not what God's called us to do. And thirdly, just like the parable, we're all going to give an account. Years ago, I, I don't know. I, when I say it's of me, I'm sure that I saw it somewhere and I take credit for it or whatever. But uh, years ago, I came across, I, I developed this thing for marriage. And um, I'm going to have to use one. Here it is. I, I developed a thing called the V of conflict. And uh, in, in premarital stuff, and even after people get married, they say, well, I can't get along. What's the problem? Why does it drive me crazy? Or she drive me crazy. But. I developed a thing, and some of you that I've done your weddings, and, and uh, you'll remember this, but do you all see the V up at the top of the pages? You know, we have a V of conflict, and, and it starts off real small. You know, it was just something, and, and I believe this. Paul wrote it, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. If we don't get it right, then the V of conflict gets wider. And, and then it, if, you, if it goes further and further, it gets wider and wider and wider. And before long, it can go so far <laughs> That you wonder, how in the world did we get way out here? It's because we're going somewhere. Okay? You say, Brother Jay, you, I lost you. Let me try to bring you back in, okay? Here's the thought. If we embrace things that don't bring glory and honor to the Lord, then it starts us down a path that's not good. If you start, if you and I as believers in Christ start making a place for this and for that, and maybe that's so, but it doesn't line up with God's word, we need to be very careful, folks. Because in our domain and in our, in our dominion, the place that God gave us, if we compromise that, then it's going to be faulty all the way across. Because once you start going a direction, it's very dangerous. And I just want to remind you of that. There's a domino effect. If you think that's not true, it's, it's found in the Word of God. You want me to give you an example? The Scripture says that God will visit the iniquity on the third and fourth generation. Does that mean God up in heaven is going, well, you know, Jay's great-granddaddy wasn't right, so I'm going to make sure there's no way he can be right? That's not, I don't believe that's what that means at all. It means I'm, I, am, I watched my parents and I became a part of who they are. And they watched their parents and they watched their parents. My dad and I have had conversations, and it goes back to my granddaddy. But my dad says very little about my great-granddaddy, which is fourth generation. And it's unique. We're always binding that kind of deal. So if we go a right direction, I think God's going to bless it and honor it. 
But if we go a wrong direction, there's a domino effect that occurs. And we think it doesn't matter the way I live. Let me tell you something. Somebody's watching your life. They might be kin to you or not kin to you, but somebody's affected by the way that we live. All right? The domino effect. Here's how I want to I wanna end this way. I want to show you something. I alluded to my wife and I and, and our, our marriage. But think about this. Uh, when I think about dominion, dominance uh, or dominion is not ruling. No, it's about responsibility. When I unpackage this in the weeks to come, it will not be a slight at my wife when I say that God's called me to be the head of the home. We hear words like head. and mm-hmm. I remember early in ministry, I had, a, I had a couple of people who said, well, I'm going to let you do the vows as long as you don't say something about obey. Mm. Listen to me. I'm not ruling Suzanne. I'm not that dumb. It's about responsibility. We're paying a high price. Listen to me. You're going to hear it in a few weeks too. We're paying a high price in America because we've changed the home. Amen? Do you believe it or not? I don't know if you do. See, we've just braced, we've embraced all this worldly stuff and we're doing. And yet it pay, we pay a price. And what I'm talking about, dominion, I'm not talking about ruling. It's about responsibility. If you love dogs and you love cats and you love horses and you love the creation... I believe you're supposed to rule over it. <laughs> but it's not ruling, it's responsibility. Secondly, it's not being superior stewardship. <laughs> this might hurt you, but you don't own anything. God owns it. He's just allowed you to have it. But we're going to give an account for what we did with it, which leads to the last. Dominion is not authority. That's God who's the authority. That's last week's sermon. It's about accountability. I want to end with Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Watch this now. This shows you the whole progression. All right? I'm going to try to do this in a couple of minutes. Dear friends, this is now the second letter I've written to you. In both letters, Peter said, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder. Watch this. So that you recall the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. Above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days. (laughs) Scoffing and following their own evil desires. Saying, where is his coming? That he promised. Hmm. Creation. Verse number nine, five. They deliberately over, overlooked this by the word of God. The heavens came into being long ago. This is what we're talking about today. And the earth was brought about from water and through water. Wow. Verse number six. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Watch this. Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You can believe whatever you want to believe about the age of the earth and how long stuff's been here, but let me tell you something. Descendants of Adam have only been here 6,000 years. And I want to just throw in some pretty neat stuff to think about. Peter, in an inspired way, prophetic way, is saying, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. That God's whole fault for Adam's race was to redeem us.